Hi, guys, and welcome to episode two of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by actual FBI cases. For this episode, I interviewed retired FBI agent Ray Carr. I interviewed him about his career, and he talks about his role as a profiler, as an FBI profiler in the field, analyzing cold and difficult to solve cases. He talks about one of his cases that involved one of the most prolific bank robbers in the history of the FBI. The investigation takes us into hidden bunkers, stashed with maps, and weapons, and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. It's pretty fascinating. But before we get into that interview, I want to chat a little bit about uh, crime fiction, crime drama, some of the shows that are coming up on TV this week. First of all, we got to talk about The X-Files. And I have a confession. I never watched The X-Files when it was on years ago. Even though it involved, you know, FBI agents investigating paranormal and uh, aliens, um, I'm just not really interested in that kind of thing. But I'm watching this time for only one reason, and that is Gillian Anderson. I began watching her in the British crime drama The Fall. If you haven't seen it, it is very, very good. And she is fantastic in it. She plays a detective, Stella Gibson, and she is investigating a series of murders in Belfast. Now, I watched the series on Netflix. Um, I'm not sure else where else it, uh, it, it airs, but again, the only reason I'm watching The X-Files is because Gillian Anderson was so damn good in the fall. So you might want to check that out. Uh, Another recommendation I have for you uh, when it comes to crime fiction is a novel by a debut author, uh, Jack Bunker. It's called True Grit. Uh, I read it last month. And uh, in the book, uh, the book is about a down-on-his-luck lawyer who thinks of this scheme, insurance fraud scheme, in order to make some money. Uh, It's funny. It's kind of like a Carl Heisen type uh, uh, novel. Um, So, you know, if you're into that kind of thing, you might want to get a hold of True Grift, G-R-I-F-T. Just want to remind you that next week, Wednesday, February 3rd, and Thursday, February 4th, Uh, They're going to be airing on ABC the four-hour miniseries, Madoff. I'm really excited about this. Um, As you know, I'm into uh, corruption and fraud and greed, so um, I'm going to be sitting down with my uh, popcorn and and, and taking a look at uh, this miniseries. As a matter of fact, in order to prepare for the miniseries, I am currently reading Too Good to be True by Aaron Arvelund, A-R-V-E-D-L-U-N-D. And um, Aaron wrote a nonfiction book about the Madoff uh, investigation, and uh, it's really good. And it's going to give me some background as I uh, watch the Madoff miniseries. All right, so almost ready to uh, let you listen to Ray Carr, but I do have one last thing that I want to say, and that is thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I am absolutely thrilled at the response that my first episode of FBI Retired Case File Review received. Um, I want to thank everyone who uh, emailed me or called me to tell me how much they enjoyed the show. And I especially want to thank all of you who signed up for my quarterly crime fiction newsletter. Just three or four times a year, I'm going to curate uh, reviews and recommendations about good crime fiction to read or TV shows or movies about crime fiction 
And um, I'll be sending that out to anybody who would like to sign up to receive it. I guess that wraps up everything I have to say. Let's start the show. All right, everyone. Um, I want to introduce my guest for today, and it is Ray Carr. Uh, Ray, uh, when did you retire from the FBI? Uh, December of 2014. Um, how's retirement going so far? Uh, busier in retirement than actually when I was an agent. It's, uh, <laughs> it's something that everybody always told me would happen, and I never believed it until I'm now living it. When did you join the FBI? I joined I, I, uh, my EOD, my entry on duty date, April 3rd, 1989. And so you were there for a total. Don't make me do the math. I was I was in for uh, just under 26 years. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, the same amount of time I had. 26 years. All right. So why don't you take us through? Um, I'd like I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your career, and then I'd love to be able to talk to you about some of your most intriguing and exciting cases. So why don't you take us through your career? Just give us a kind of an overview of the type of investigations that you did and uh, the assignments, the locations, the offices where you were assigned? My first office was uh, Buffalo, New York. You know, they say shuffling off to Buffalo, and uh, that's exactly what I did. I didn't even know where Buffalo was. Uh, I was was so focused on maybe going to another part of the country when they told me Buffalo, but uh, when I got to Buffalo, the agents... Uh, in the Buffalo office were absolutely fantastic. I started out on an applicant squad. It was actually a violent crime squad. Applicants were there, and they enabled us to work a lot of applicants so we get used to the paperwork as well as the general neighborhoods. From there, I worked uh, bank robberies and fugitives. Uh, I worked uh, auto theft, uh, what they call interstate transportation, stolen motor vehicles, and interstate transportation of stolen property. And uh, I had a lot of fun working the bank robberies and fugitives, and I thought, boy, I, I'm really glad uh, that I had the opportunity to work this coming uh, coming right out of the academy. That's always the fun stuff they always talk about, the bank robberies and fugitives. But the one case, probably within the first six months, I got involved in a uh, in a case in Buffalo where it was involving the interstate transportation of stolen motor vehicles. Except it wasn't just between two states, the state of New York and the state of Pennsylvania. They were also going into Canada. Oh, and wow. So it's an international flavor to it. It was. And it was, it was, it was kind of a flavor that it related to uh, the Spiri Auto Parts. And they were uh, dismantling vehicles and then selling the parts and then shipping the parts. So the vehicles would be stolen and within probably 30 minutes, they would have to be completely dismantled and in parts. And then those parts were shipped out on different vehicles and tractor trailers that they would take out to different places, especially into Canada. And what happened was this Albert Steele was an individual um, who a lot of the agents in the office had been trying to, uh, to get into for a long time. And I just happened to be lucky enough uh, to cultivate a couple sources that were actually working with him and another individual that was a truck driver that drove some of the trucks for him. Now, and how did led, you do that? How did you develop these informants? If I had a, if I could have put that in a bottle, I probably could have sold it and made a lot of money. But <laughs> it, it, I guess it was just a personality thing. We just kind of hit it off. Uh, and, and they actually trusted me. I developed a, a level of trust with them just talking to them. And uh, it led us to be able, it led me to be able to first go up on pen registers, which I was able to find the people they were talking to. And then within not even a year in the Bureau, and I'm writing a Title III affidavit uh, for a wire. And not wow. just a wire to go up on their phones, but also to, to place microphones within their, uh, within their facility. And you're doing this as a as a new agent. I mean, there are there are agents yeah. who've been working, you know, major cases and 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 really complex cases that don't have, uh, you know, a wire. So, uh, you yeah, know, that's, that's that's pretty amazing. Yeah, I uh, I had some help from a from an agent by the name of Dave Hammond, 
Uh, he was kind of my mentor and my training agent, Mike Hayes. And there was another brand new agent that was actually my co-case agent on this that had less time in than I did, and his name was Stu Wirtz. Wow. And uh, so I guess I, I was surrounded by very, very good people, and that's what really helped this thing go. The the the, the greatest thing about this wire was that they had a new apparatus down in Quantico, which was a camera. And we were wanted to be able to have uh, eyes on this facility at all times, seeing them bringing things back in and uh, in and out of uh, of the Zuri Auto Parts, but they had two cameras that they put up. One was a black and white, and one was a color. It's the first time they were using. It. And the only problem is, is we were almost a mile away from the facility where we were installing the cameras. Now, some of your listeners may remember the movie The Natural, and there was a stadium, War Memorial Stadium, that was in Buffalo, that they used in that movie where they, they where they filmed everything. Right. And what happened, what we um, what we did is that they had closed the train station that was near that War Memorial Stadium. They had closed the closed train station. And we went up onto the 12th floor and installed both of these cameras and then was able to microwave the signal back to uh, the office and then be able to go in with these cameras and actually pick up license plates of vehicles. Now, were you watching this real time or was it being recorded or both? This was, this was being recorded, but it was also real time. So we were able to be proactive. So it was, it was amazing technology for 1990 uh, that we had at that point. And I I just thought that was really unique about that. And then the the case kind of came for Trishan. Some people were arrested. Um, and, and things went, things went really well with, uh, with Buffalo. Uh, in, uh, in 1991, late 1991, I was transferred back to Philadelphia. And, uh, I was again placed on Squad 10. The famous Squad 10 out of Philadelphia. Which yeah, that was the, yeah, the very famous bank robbery and violent crime squad. Right. And at that time, it was also, uh, terrorism was work, worked off that squad as well. I got because this was uh, uh, pre nine uh, eleven, uh, so although we were working terrorism at the time, it is nothing, nothing like we are uh, focused on it uh, now. That's correct. That's correct. And it it, uh, it was it was quite an awakening uh, coming on. I mean, the personalities on Squad Ten. Uh, if you had everybody, I mean, first of all, just about everybody on Squad Ten was a member of the SWAT team. So it, it was just great having that type of expertise on a squad that you're working with and learning from those guys because I was still a fairly new agent with a little over three years in. So mm-hmm. I was still learning a lot. And um, Did you eventually join our, the, the SWAT team? I was on, a, uh, was on the SWAT team briefly, and then uh, I moved over to negotiations. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wound up being on the negotiation team for over 20 years. Okay, tell us a little bit more about that. The hostage negotiation you're talking about? Yes. It was on the hostage negotiation team. The the one drawback about the hostage negotiation team is that it was not used uh, as much uh, within the Philadelphia area, although I had, the, uh, I had the opportunity to be involved in quite a few um, hostage situations, but it's not it's not like you see on TV. You're really not used as much. However, there are a lot of negotiators. I was not one of them, uh, unfortunately, that had the chance to travel internationally and uh, and do some uh, some some negotiating on an international basis. I wanted to do those things, but things got uh, things got as you work cases, you you get caught up in working your cases. And these are collateral duties, so you don't have the opportunity to do some of the things that you would that you would like to do with them. Well, did you get training to be a hostage negotiator? How did that work? Yes, it was training in the field, and then they send you to Quantico for a two week training period, where you go through two weeks of training, and they provide you with uh, a certification that you're now a negotiator. Uh, I was on the negotiation team with Tommy Couples. And uh, Mike Johnson, and when Mike Johnson left the bureau, the team fell on to me, and I became the team leader for the 
for the Philadelphia Association team. Now, there's a picture that you sent me that I'll put up on the uh, on the website, and you look like you're in SWAT gear. Um, yes. What's wh- what's that picture about? Uh, we were up at Fort Indian Town Gap, and we were I was doing some propelling off a three story uh, apparatus okay. as we were going through some training. Yeah, it's a pretty cool picture. Um, that's what I thought that you might be repelling. It looked like you uh, had some. Uh, some ropes and things around you. It's a, it's a great picture to have. It's you know a lot of times in our careers we get to do all of this cool stuff, but there's no photos um, to you know to mem- to remember the stuff by. And so that's great that you have that really cool picture. Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, you're right. There really isn't a whole lot of photos. I mean, and uh, you're out doing things, and things happen so fast that the photos are usually taken after everything's after all the excitement's over. Hey, let's go back a little bit because I forgot to ask you what you were doing before you became an agent. I worked at a school for adjudicated delinquents. It's a school by the name of Glen Mills. Uh, It's located on about 826 acres in southeastern Pennsylvania in the town of Glen Mills. And I started there in 1979 as a counselor. I moved my way up uh, to a senior counselor. I ran a unit, and then my last four years at the facility, I was the director of personnel or director of human resources, as they call it now, and I was also a football coach. Okay. I remember that well um, because when you came in the Bureau, uh, I kind of helped you through the uh, the new agent recruitment program. I actually <laughs> ran it in, in the Philadelphia office. And I don't know if you remember this, but that's how I started. I actually, before I became an FBI agent, I was a juvenile probation officer and counselor, aftercare counselor, traveling over the state of Virginia uh, to all of these um, uh, juvenile delinquent uh, centers, uh, counseling adjudicated uh, youth. So we had something in common back then. I remember it well. Yes, I do remember that, Terry. And you know the funny thing about it is when I came back to Philly, it's amazing how many times I used the things I learned at Glen Mills to help me in the FBI and how many people that I locked up that had been at Glen Mills. <laughs> so, so you had that in common with them, yeah. I, it really, and, and it's amazing. Well, that's that, not a good thing, though, I guess. But, you know, no, it's not, but, you know, but, but the ones that did, it, the co- their level of cooperation and their barriers, once, they, once we start talking that language when they were younger, just kind of dropped, and they and they became a lot more uh, uh, collaborative, and they became a lot more cooperative as a result of that, which I thought was a good thing for for the FBI. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's kind of sad because they're recidivists and 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 back into the system, but it definitely gave you something that you had in common with them that allowed them to uh, feel better about cooperating with you. So, yeah, that that did work out well. Well, you know, though, too, Jared, that's always, whenever, and you know, as I do, you're always, whenever you're talking to somebody for the first time, and, and uh, I, you know, people always say, well, what, what were you in? I said, I was involved in sales. And I said, sales? I didn't know the FBI did sales. And I said, yes, I used to sell jail time. And I said, I was actually pretty good at it. And I said, that's, <laughs> that's really what it is, is that you're always trying to find that common ground where, because people are so defensive in the beginning, and once you find that common ground, it enables people to, it knocks down barriers, and it just makes things go a lot quicker, a lot smoother. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. So we're now, we're back in Philly again. Um, yep. You are on the bank robbery, violent crime squad. You're doing yep. hostage negotiations. So take us, uh, take us on. Well, uh, there was a, an agent by the name of Ed Garrity, and he was getting ready to retire. And my supervisor, Tom McQuaid, came to me and he says, hey, look, we need to send someone down to Quantico for this National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime, the BAU unit. That, that's what it was called then, the, B, the BSU unit, the Behavioral Science Unit. And he says, it's a bunch of hocus-pocus stuff. And I says, I'll go. I always wanted to do that because when I was in class at Quantico, one of the guys that came through and talked to us was John Douglas and Robert Ressler. And, you know, they hadn't written any books at that point, but I thought their pitch and what they talked about I found to be fascinating. 
So I went down to Quantico, and I all, I all of a sudden became a a coordinator for the Behavioral Science Unit, which is now the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime. Ed Garrity retired, and I became the uh, the team leader of all the coordinators, which at that time it was just me, because it wasn't a it was just a program that was just sitting in the field. So you know, I started looking, and there were some cases that were coming in. There was a a case of a of a young child, 11 years old, and you might remember this case, Jerry. Is I think it was in the early 90s, 92 or 93. Mark Heinbach, who was an 11 year old boy, who came up missing in Cape May County, and he had been down the shore with his family over the weekend, and he came up missing. And to this day, they've never found him. Oh, that's um, bad. And he was he was resided. He was from Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania, which was up in the Philly area. But we worked in conjunction. Uh, with New Jersey State Police with that, but we were never able to bring any closure to that case, which is sad. And that's a case that kind of always haunts you as you kind of think about it. Hey, things kind of progressed on. Uh, we were getting our socks knocked off with bank robberies, I think, in 92, 93. I think there were more than 200 bank robberies just in the city of Philadelphia and, and 26 armored car robberies. So it was, we were very, very busy. Uh, kind of Could I stop you for a minute? Because I, I want to make yeah. sure I get an understanding and that the listeners get an understanding of what this program was. Because you're talking about behavioral science, and we all know that the behavioral science unit, you know, down on the FBI Academy campus. Um, but this is something that's done in the field. You're, you're trained to do some of that same type of 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 review, case review for field cases. Not just field cases, but what what the what the National Center for Analysis of Crime is and the coordinators in the field. What happens is when there's an unsolved uh, homicide, an unsolved rape, uh, an unsolved tampering with products, uh, threat assessment, uh, kidnappings. Uh, there's um, expertise for search warrants, uh, interview strategies. All these different things are things that are worked out of the National, the uh, National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime down in Quantico. They send agents from the field down there and train them. Now, I would have the opportunity to not just do a two-week stint down at Quantico, but I came back for a four-week stint, and I went down for several other stints, 30 days at a time, working in the unit to hone my skills that would allow me to better serve the state and local police departments within the Philadelphia area. So as they would bring cases to us, I would review them, get them ready, and then in conjunction with Quantico, I would work those cases with the local uh, with the local police departments. All right. So these are cases that a local police department um, has been working and working, and they feel that with the help of the FBI taking a, a look at it, that it might get closer to being resolved. That is correct. That is correct. The, the the only cases that are ever brought to the unit are cases that the local and state agencies feel are unsolvable. So they're bringing it and asking for us to do an analysis of looking at the behavior that's occurred within the crime scene and the behavior exhibited by both the victim and the offender in helping us to identify who the offender is that they don't because they don't know who that is. So although we can't give them a name, we can give them the type of person they should be looking for based upon the interactions that occurred within the crime scene. Fascinating. Do you have a case that you could talk to us about uh, that, you know, you worked on and, and found success? Well, this actually was a case that was actually an FBI case, which is kind of ironic when say it's mostly the state and local. But here we had a case uh, where Scranton, our Scranton, Scranton office up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and the Albany office out of our Albany division, which was the Kingston RA, had a series of bank robberies that had been occurring since around 19, uh, 1988. And these bank robberies had occurred, and they had probably around 25 or 26 robberies that had occurred between 1988 and 2000. 
And they asked me if I would take a look at these robberies to see if we could come up with a an MO, a modus operandi, or any type of signature behavior, or anything that we may be able to provide to them to help them with that. So, Did I they think them, all of these cases were done by the same person? They suspected it? They suspected they were, because it, it, the, the modus operandi of how this individual came in, he would come into the bank just prior to closing. He usually wore a Halloween-type mask or old man mask, wore baggy clothing, carried a shoulder bag over his shoulder, and he always had a handgun in his right hand. He would come in just prior to closing. He was in and out of the bank, and he would just vanish into thin air. Mm -hmm. And he were never able to, uh, never able to identify who he was. They would tell me, they'd say, look, we were out on surveillance of the banks we thought he was going to be at on every Friday night, because it was on Friday nights these banks were occurring. So he said, we would sit outside these banks for two Fridays in a row and nothing would happen. We'd take a Friday off and he'd hit the, and he'd hit the bank and we'd say, what, is he surveilling us or are we surveilling, trying to surveil him? So it was very frustrating, not only for the FBI up in those, up in those areas, but also the state police and the local police departments. So they send the files down. I'm taking a look at the files, and there was an R-based program. I'm having one of our analysts submit all this information in so we can kind of pick up some tendencies. And I get a phone call. This is April of 2001. I get a phone call from a local police department, uh, Radnor Police Department, and the police officer is a friend of mine, a detective. He says, hey, Ray, he says, uh, on Sunday, he said, we found... Um, some kids were playing out in the woods adjacent to the police station, and we uh, found what is a we believe is a bunker that was into the ground that kind of concerns us. We think it may be uh, some sort of militia group because there were five weapons and there's several hundred rounds of ammunition here, and it has this really concern. Can you come out and take a look at it? And I says, yeah, okay, so... I, I go out, and they what they said, he says, the first thing these kids found was a a black drainage tube about 18 inches in diameter that was buried into the side of a berm. And they said they moved this out, and what they did is they start going through it, and they found these PVC tubes, which were about three inches in diameter, and inside these PVC tubes were documents, a lot of documents. And they start looking at these documents, and the documents start talking about the disassembly of a nine millimeter Beretta. The kids, 11 and 12 years old, became scared. They take it and walk it over to the police station. Said, look, we were playing in the woods and we found this drainage tube. Oh, we don't know what it is. So the two police officers go back with them. And they say, show us where you found this. They walk back and one of the police officers had been on a platoon in Vietnam. So he knew how to look for booby traps and things of that nature. And he stumbled upon a, uh, a hole in the ground that was covered by debris. Well, this hole in the ground was probably about four foot in diameter and about three foot deep. And it was outlined in brick. Like someone took a long time to dig this out. And wow. inside of it, inside of this hole were ammo cans, military ammo cans. And there were a couple of five gallon buckets. And inside the ammo cans were hundreds of rounds of ammunition and five weapons, all with obliterated, obliterated serial numbers. And there were a lot of other documents. So when I, I can out, understand, yeah, I can understand why they called you because like, oh, you know, what, what is this stuff? Why is it, why is it there? Right. So it, the first thing I do is I, because they found all the ammunition, I don't know what, what's in some of the other PPC tubes they haven't opened up. I said, look, let's put them out back. So we have the ability to x-ray them, which, uh, which they did. They found everything was fine. We brought some bomb dogs in to do a sweep uh, because of the ammunition, to make sure there's nothing in there. But as I'm looking at this stuff with uh, an individual by the name of Richard Marks, uh, who was um, part of the evidence response team at the time, we're looking at this stuff. And I said, with all the other agents, I said, I know who this guy is. Wow. And everybody looks at me like they're going, what do you mean you know who this is? How the heck do you know that? They looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, listen, I said, I don't know his name, but this is the guy that Scranton and New York have been looking for for the last 
you know, the last 13, 14 years. That is unbelievable. Now, how how you you got this case from Scranton and and Albany? How soon after was this bunker found? How, how long had you been working on it? About five months, almost six months. I was looking and studying the material. And, and he had been committing bank robberies since. Did you say eighty eight? Eighty eight, nineteen eighty eight. Yes. Wow. And we're at so, two thousand and two thousand and one. We're in April two thousand one. Now, what what is that? Is that luck? Is that fate? Is that? Well, is, I I say it's it's always better to be lucky than good. I mean, I think the stars were aligned, um, and for whatever reason, somebody put me in a position to be able to see these things, and having studied what this guy was about for the last five months, and putting together my my thought process what it is, and then seeing the things in the bunker, I said this is him. It's him. He's more of him is just buried here in this bunker. All right. So at this time, you know this is the guy committing the bank robberies, but you have no idea who he is. That's correct. Okay. Now tell us. I, I'm, you know what? I really do know this story because we've talked about it many times, but I am still fascinated. So tell us more. What happened? Well, next? what I do is I send all the material down the down the Quantico down to our lab. And I'm having them do all the different tests on it. Uh, and what what I do, I say, listen, I need you to determine if there are any fingerprints and to identify those prints as soon as you can, and I need you to get back to me. And about a week, they came back, and they says, uh, uh, we, identif- we identified the prints as, uh, you know, w- w- we're not sure yet, but we're, we're, act- we're actually still looking. So what happens is, I'm now, while they're doing all the, the work down there, I'm starting to do investigative work up here. And I find in there, there's a list of banks, 160 banks are listed inside of what all the, in all these documents. And there's a lot of other things in the documents. There's a mention of textbooks, and all the textbooks are math and, uh, and the stat books. And then there's uh, a mention of documents about Camp Hill, and there's mention about a Camp Hill yearbook. Uh, there's karate videos. So I'm looking karate videos, and then there's a thing called Dillman plaques. So I Google Dillman, and I find this guy, George Dillman. So I send an agent from Allentown in the Reading to interview George Dillman to see if he knows anything or can open any light to it, and he can't. He says, look, I have hundreds of dojos all over the country. So I decided I'm going to send the lead. So he, this, every- this guy, Dillman, owns... All of these karate studios all over the country. He does not own them. He, they use his name, so it's like a franchise. Okay. That use his name. That use his type of uh, tempo karate. That I guess he, I guess you would call it. So I decide I'm going to send a lead out to all these different uh, areas where these dojos are located. I had a list. And I said before I do that, I said let me go out to one of the dojos here and see if I can you know, kind of formulate the questions I want to ask. So there were three. There was one in Wayne, PA, on Henry Avenue. There was one in Drexel Hill on State Street, and there was one up in Bluebell, PA. So I said, well, Drexel Hill's closest, so I'll go to Drexel Hill. So myself and the trooper go to Drexel Hill, and the first guy that comes up to us, you know, he fits kind of what I'm looking at, like, you know, about 5'7", 5'6", 5'7", uh, kind of narrow-minded, kind of, you know, thin, a little bit older. So, uh, you know, he tells me he's the owner, part owner of the doge of this, uh, karate studio, and the other owner is a medical doctor. And we're waiting for him to come. So in the meantime, I'm talking to this guy, and, and I'm trying to get a read on him. I'm thinking, you know, this could be him. I, could be anybody. But you, you know, don't mention, I, are you mentioning the, the bunker at this time? No. No. So he has no idea why you're there. No, we just want to talk to him. So I, I'm saying to him, I says, uh, so I'm talking to him, and I says, uh, just trying to get a feel for him. And he's very cool. So I'm thinking, if he was he was involved or he was a suspect, I would notice a little bit of nervousness. So I said to him, I said, well, what do you do for a living? He says, I'm a teacher. I says, I'm thinking, does this guy teach math because of all the math books? So I said, well, what do you teach? He says, I teach biology and physics. I said, okay, but he was too cool. So the doctor comes, we start talking, and I says. Uh, Look, we're looking for a guy about five six, five eight, high risk individual. Giving some other information to him, and he says, "Well, geez, that sounds like Carl." And he says, "Carl who?" And he says, "Carl Gagasian." 
And I says, well, look, don't say anything to him. I says, no, it's probably nothing. But I said, we'll probably go talk to him. I said, we, right in. They said, no problem. He won't say a word. He says, uh, he said he was a fifth degree black belt in karate. He said he was a mountain climber, rock climber, ice climber. Did a lot of traveling all over the world. And I said, what did he do for a living? He says he's a self-employed statistician. Well, there's all the math books. There you go. So we go back. Now, what 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 are you telling them? Why why are you looking for this guy? Do, do they have any idea what this person has done? You know that you're interested um, in identifying this person. No, we just said we were conducting an investigation on some robberies. Probably not him, but uh, you know someone. The bank robberies. Him. Right, bank robberies. We're looking at some bank robberies. Probably not him, but someone said the guy may have a background in karate. So we're just trying to figure out if there's anybody in here that that kind of fits a description that we're looking at. And I don't think it's him. I really played it off, tried to play it off as best I could, because I didn't want it getting back to him, and then him fleeing. I just just got a name. I really still didn't know who he was. Uh, so we go back and we run up run up a, a criminal history on him. He has a juvenile record and a couple of uh, a couple of arrests as an adult, but his juvenile record placed him at Camp Hill, which again ties us back to the documents. Mm. So I says, I says, well, I think this is our guy. So the next day I have uh, the girl run up a, a check for his address and she screams, uh, Nancy does, because she works in the office, and I said, what's the matter? And she says, uh, hey, he lives right across the street from where the first bunk was found. Wow. So I says, well, I says, okay. So I said, well, let's go out and see what uh, what his apartment complex will tell us. So I go out to the apartment complex, and I walk in, I introduce myself, who I am. And I says, I'm interested in talking to you about your resident in apartment 119A. And the girl says, I knew it. And I says, you knew what? She says, He's a he's in a witness protection program, right? And I says, No. He says, Well then he's is he in the CIA? And I says, No. I says, Why do you ask? They said, Because he's really weird. And I says, Well, what do you mean he's weird? They said, Well, he runs a lot. I said, Well, you know, I know a lot of people that run. Yeah, but he runs fully clothed with a backpack. So I said, Okay, that's weird. And it kind of went there, but he was not there, he had moved. And we traced them up to Plymouth meeting, and we did some more uh, some more investigation. And inside the bunker, I failed to mention previously, in the documents were additional bunkers all over the eastern part of the country, and we were able. Oh wow! To trace so there wasn't just this bunker. He had stored away what ammunition and weapons and maps. Yeah, and we actually located one of the bunkers. Uh, which turned out to be a cave up uh, in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, with the help of uh, some of the state gangland guys who was an expert in that area up there. And we were able to locate an additional nine bunkers with his help. And in one of the bunkers, which was a cave, there were 27 weapons and thousands of rounds of ammunition. So it was pretty extensive what we found. But the greatest thing is, is that fast forwarding here, we wind up arresting him. 9-11 happened. Everything shut down. We wind up arresting him in, two, in February 2002, and he leads us to another 16 bunkers. So in totality, we actually located 27 bunkers, recovered over 50 weapons, and about uh, about eighty-five, ninety thousand dollars $90,000, which were proceeds from his last two bank robberies that he did in 2002 before his arrest. Which now, why did he do this? Why did he lead you to all these additional bunkers? He was cooperating. Uh, it, it, when we first arrested him, he would not say anything to us. He would not share any information with us. Uh, he completely shut down. Um, he was a very, you know, he was a very uh, proud man. He was in his early 50s. Uh, he was 51 years old, 52 years old. Um, Unbelievable shape for his age. Um, he did a did a lot of different things. And the thing is here is that you know, I don't want to give you too much here, Jared, because I'm writing a book about this. <laughs> this and, I, that, that was going through my mind. This is a book. I mean, this this is a movie. This this story is amazing. Yeah. So we're, I'm hoping with uh, within the year 
that we, um, we were lucky enough to get this thing moving forward. We're very, very close. Who's uh, we? we just have myself and uh, the individual writing with me is Joe Slobosian, and Joe was the Inquirer reporter uh, that did the initial story on this case. Okay, yeah, I know Joe. So it's a, it's a great it's a great thing, but the reason why he and when I I had the opportunity kind of at the end and and kind of how this thing is is the relationship that him and I developed and and uh, I had the opportunity to go in and talk to him and the, the lawyers for him told me they said look you're going to get one shot to talk to him and it, that'll depend whether we, whether we go to trial or not well I went in to talk to him and you know right away. Uh, my whole thing was, is, hey, look, I need to disarm him so that I'm not a threat and I didn't want to be a threat, you know, and I, and I think I was able to do that. And so this uh, is where your hostage negotiation skills probably played a big absolutely, part. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. They did. And, and all my training within the FBI on, on uh, taking interview, interview and interro- in interrogation courses, all those things were were instrumental in everything that I did within the Bureau, in, in, in everything I do in life. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's, it's amazing how much of that transfers over into what you do in real life. It really is. This is absolutely fascinating. So how does it end? He he pleads guilty? He does plead guilty. Uh, and what he, kind of time did he get? He gets 17 and a half years in jail. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's presently at Fort Dix at their minimum security. He's scheduled to be released to a halfway house in October of 2017. Wow, just around the corner. Now, yeah. do you think, uh, have you had any dealings with him since? Do you think you'll have any uh, cooperation with him on your book and any future uh, deals? Or is, is that even necessary? Well, it's not really necessary, but I gave him the opportunity. I went out to Fort Dix before I left, you know, before I left the Bureau a couple times, and I and I sat down with him. I had to have him, as I was cleaning up, I had to have him sign some documents to destroy weapons. We were destroying some of the weapons that he had. Uh, there was a, we were holding on to the weapons because there was some question that they wanted to put them on the FBI tour, uh, that they haven't, but it's, things just got too late, so I just wound up destroying them. I had plenty of photographs they could have if they need them, photographs of the weapons. Um, but, uh, he decided he didn't want anything to do with anything with the book or any notoriety, he wants to kind of put this behind him. Mm. He's a very, very private guy, and you have to remember something. The, gr- the funny thing about this guy is that although they thought he was robbing banks in 1987, when I sat down and talked to him, he robbed his first bank in 1972. What? So, yeah, so it wasn't as though he had robbed the banks for 13 years. He robbed banks for 30 years before Why? he Why? He was a statistician. Um what did he do with the money? What, what did he? I mean, That's was it about lived. the money? No, it was well. It, it goes back to his childhood, and uh, when he was arrested, and uh, some things that were said by a guidance counselor, and his thought process that his juvenile record would never be expunged. He spent time in Camp Hill. I told you as a juvenile, he was shot uh, by a Haverford Township police officer uh, committing a burglary. Uh, so there's a lot of things that kind of go into this that, that kind of formed him. But you're going to have to read the book, Jer. You're going to have to read the book. If I tell you this, you won't buy the book. Okay. And I do want to buy the book. I do want to buy the book. Um, okay. I'm not going to ask any more questions. This was absolutely fascinating. Um, you know, we had talked about this this before. Um, uh, you gave me a little bit more information than I knew before. And I just find it absolutely fascinating. Uh, you know, and I think one of the things that is different that people don't understand is they talk about behavioral science and, you know, what happens at, uh, at at the academy, you know, to see that you're doing that, you know, painstaking analysis of cold and closed, you know, cold cases, you know, in the field is something that I think most people are, are not aware of. Yes. Uh, and, you know, Jared, it's, a, it's a, an old adage. I'm sure you've heard this before. Maybe a lot of your listeners haven't, but it's working as an FBI agent is an unbelievable, satisfying experience. Not that just the work itself, but the 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 opportunity and the chance to make a difference. 
what everybody and all your listeners see on TV, what they watch, uh, we get to live firsthand. It's like having a ticket to the greatest show on earth. Oh, I like that. I do like that. All right, so we're, we've uh, been talking now for, for quite a while, so it's probably time for us to kind of wrap it up. Is there anything else that uh, you'd like to, to, to share with us, to talk about, uh, some experiences you've had? Um, is, is there anything that um, we, we need to, to, to chat about before we, uh, we end the show? No, sure. I, I, I think it's – I want to thank you and, and thank your listeners for, uh, for taking the time out sit down and listen to me and you today i think it's uh uh i think it's it's a fabulous opportunity and um you know um if there's anybody out there that's that's young and, and has a desire uh to get involved in police work the the best agency in the world that you could ever work for is the fbi um, there's no, I second there's no that. place, no place I better no place better yeah all right, Ray. So uh, it's been fabulous talking with you. I know you share with me a number of pictures, and um, I'm also going to put some links to uh, some of the articles about the cases that we've discussed today. And they're all going to be on jerrywilliams.com, and uh, people can go there. They can get a look at what Ray Carr, Special Agent Ray Carr, retired, looks like. And um, it's been fabulous. I want to thank you so much. Uh, we've known each other for a number of years now. Um, I admire the work that you've done for the Bureau, and it's fascinating uh, you know, to hear you talk about uh, this unbelievable case. Well, Jerry, thank you so much for the opportunity, and, and uh, uh, it's been fantastic being on your show. And I hope down in the future, maybe you have me back, we can talk about another case. Oh, that would be fantastic. Thank you. And good luck with the book. Thanks, Chair. Okay. All right. And that's the end of the show. Don't forget, at jerrywilliams.com, you'll find photos and links to related news articles in the show notes for this interview. Today's episode was sponsored by FBIRetire.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I hope we can connect again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review. Thank you.